Met Virtual Traveller, and welcome to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that invites you to rewild yourself through story by exploring nature, folklore, and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson, and I'm an author and professional storyteller. Season three is here, and for this season, we will be looking at the folklore of hedges, fishermen, farmyards, allotments, but, well, not necessarily in that order. And as always, patrons will be voting in a monthly poll to choose the theme for the following month's episode. After seven episodes, I will then take a break to work on the themes for the next season. As you will know, if you've been following me for a while, my passion is connecting people with the landscape and nature through story. So for this season, I've made a few changes to the podcast, to bring nature in a bit closer. To do this, I will be visiting the places relevant to the themes in each episode and be recording the nature and plant life that can be found in that place or habitat before linking in the folklore and, of course, the stories. For a long time, I've also wanted to look into the old English ballads collected by Roud and Child. And so I will be singing some of these on the podcast for you, again, relevant to the theme for that month. For this episode, patrons chose Beneath the Snowy Thorn, and so I'm taking you on a tour of my local hedgerows, talking about the folklore of the flora and fauna found there, telling the story of Yallery Brown, and singing the ballad of Thomas the Rhymer. I do hope you will enjoy the new format. So without further ado, here is episode one of season three, Beneath the Snowy Thorn. I'm walking up the hill on my uh, regular route past the garden hedgerows which are at the bottom of the hill where the road is. Garden hedgerows are made up of yew, hazel, box and holly and in the spring and summer they're usually full of dunnocks and sparrows but they're a lot quieter today. These are some of my favourite hedges, the ones that edge the road, which you would think wasn't that well travelled, but there's still a fair amount of farm traffic goes along it. And I have to throw myself into the hedge every now and then to avoid getting mown down. But what I love about this hedge is that as you walk along beside it, occasionally you get the odd blackbird or robin hopping about is not too perturbed by you but beneath down in the roots you'll hear a little squeak and a rustle every now and then of the field mice running for cover. I've yet to see one of these hedge dwellers so when I say they field mice it's a big assumption but it's more than likely. Occasionally I see the odd tail disappearing She's definitely mouse-like. A plethora of grasses, dying dock, plantain and nettles. Now grumpy and likely to sting you, even if you get just a fraction too close. Clematis, about to become old man's beard. Holm oak, hawthorn. It's all here at the top of the hill in the hedgerow. As I enter the field, this hedgerow is a little different. As the farmer has been uh, creating strips of uh, pollinating plants and wildlife havens for the animals, so this hedgerow has become a little more wild. And it's just beautiful to look at. There are a few blackberries still here. There's the ivy flower that I was talking about earlier in full bloom. And on it, I can see the 
ragged edges of a comma. Probably one of the last ones. Just supping on the nectar. There's also a lot of hawthorn here and sloes. So it's a bit of a foraging heaven for everyone, this hedgerow. But beneath it is a thick blanket of nettles. So you have to be quite bold and brave to get to the hedgerow bounty. As I round the end of what I call the wild hedge, there's another tall hedge of hazel which runs along the edge of the next field. And from it, you often get great flocks of birds come up out of it because next to it is a large strip of sunflowers which will go to seed soon and that provides lots of food for them. I think these birds are probably meadow pipits or finches of some description. I've yet to actually manage to get a definite identification on them. But I'm pretty sure they're meadow pipits. Lovely little birds. Another burgeoning bit of hedgerow on the corner of this field. And this is the one with the cherry trees in it, which is full of wild cherries. Earlier in the year, sort of August time. I can see just the last one or two left on the branches that the birds haven't yet discovered. Or maybe they're just not worth eating and they know that. Here there is also bramble and hawthorn, plenty of hawthorn berries. They make a good ketchup, although I haven't tried it myself yet. As I walk back down the other side of the hill, I'm into woodland with high banks of ivy and holly and beech trees towering above me. It's not really clear where the hedgerow ended and the wood began. Isn't that wonderful? I hope you enjoy this new format and that it helps you to connect with nature a bit more and seasonal living, as well as the folklore of our ancestors and the messages that the stories of the oral storytelling tradition hold. Thomas de Rymer, or Thomas the Rymer, is a 13th century character most famous for appearing in the Old English Ballad collected by Francis James Child and catalogued as number 37, and also collected by Steve Roud, catalogued as 219. He is a character carried off by the Queen of Elfland as he sleeps beneath the Eildon tree, or in some cases a hawthorn, and when he returns he can no longer lie. This is my version of the ballad of Thomas the Rhymer. True Thomas lay on Huntley Bank, a fairy he did spy. And there he saw a lady bright 
come riding down by the hawthorn tree. Her dress was o'er、oh, the grass green silk, her mantle velvet fine, and all upon her horse's mane hang fifty silver bells and nine. True Thomas he pulled off his cap and crouched upon his knee. All hail, thou mighty queen of heaven! No other on earth did I ever see. Oh no, oh no, Thomas! She said, "That name is not for me. I am the queen of fair Elfland, and I have come to visit thee." Up and walk, Thomas! She said, "Up and walk along with me." And if ye dare to kiss my lips, sure of you I shall be. Beside me joy, beside me sorrow. Neither shall daunt me. And so he kissed her rosy lips under the hawthorn tree. Now you will go with me, she said. To Thomas, come with me. And you shall serve me seven years, through sorrow and joy as may be. She mounted on her milk-white steed, and to Thomas sat behind. And whenever the bells did ring, the horse rode swifter still. And on they rode, and farther on, the horse it gathered speed, until they reached. A wide expanse, their living land left behind. Light down, light down, now, Thomas True, and lean your head upon my knee. Abide and rest a little space, and I will show the fairies to thee. We'll see you now that narrow road, so thick with thorns and briars. Tis the path to the unknown. Do you dare walk with me, Thomas? If you hold your tongue, whatever you may see and hear, if you do not speak within my land, no harm will come to thee. She gave him a coat of velvet cloth and a pair of shoes so green. Until the seven years were past, to Thomas on earth was never seen. As you heard in my hedgerow tour, even though it's autumn, there is still plenty going on in the hedgerows around the fields and lanes where I live. So now I'd like to take a little look at the folklore associated with these hedgerows. Some of the most common shrubs that make up hedges in the UK are hawthorn, blackthorn, ivy, beech, hazel, oak, and holly. And these can all be found in the hedges around and about my village. Some of these hedgerows are left more wild, and others hacked back. The ones that are hacked back tend to be on the roads to allow the cars passage. In 1974, Dr. Max Hooper came up with a way of aging hedgerows. He reckoned that if you counted how many species of shrub there were in the hedge, and then times this by 110 years, you'd come up with the age of the hedge. Well, whilst this sounds like a fabulous formula, it unfortunately does not withstand application. There is some contention surrounding what is a woody shrub and what is considered a hedgerow tree. So, how do you know which ones you're going to times by 110? Plus, when the hedge gets to a certain size, people have found that the numbers just don't really add up. The quickest way to grow a hedge is by using hazel and hawthorn, and since the 1400s, this has been called a quick-set hedge. However, it's not the speed at which it grows. That the quick refers to, the quick actually refers to the fact that the hedge is planted using live cuttings, as in the phrase "the quick and the dead." One of the most commonly mentioned shrubs or trees in folklore is, of course, the hawthorn. 
The hawthorn is one of the first shrubs to flower in the spring and as such is a symbol of hope. And the haw, H-A-W, in the Old English can be translated as hedge. From this word comes the haywood. This is the person in the village responsible for the upkeep of the hedges and the village boundary, even repatriating stray animals and cattle. It is considered a charm of protection and is often hung above the doorways to ward off unwanted visitors, such as fairies or those practising dark magic. The Romans used the hawthorn as a charm for protecting newborns, placing a sprig of hawthorn in the cradle with them. And in Athens, women would wear a crown of hawthorn flowers on their wedding day and carry a torch made of hawthorn. It is, of course, common in folklore that powerful plants can be used for both good and bad, and so it is that the hawthorn has a reputation for bringing bad luck should it be brought into the house whilst in flower. This may be because as it rots, the flowers are said to smell akin to rotting corpses. This is thought to come from the plague years and was first recorded in 1627 by Francis Bacon. There is, it has been discovered, a chemical in the flowers which is identical to the one found in rotting meat. So it is possible. But either way, it's probably best to leave those flowers at the door. Hawthorn leaves, flowers and fruit were commonly carved by the stonemasons of the late 13th and early 14th centuries. They appear in bosses, arches, shrines and fonts found in the churches of this era and they are indicative of the enduring belief that the hawthorn was powerful against evil. Again showing that Christianity didn't necessarily wipe out these pagan beliefs, it simply synchronised them. The hawthorn is most prominently associated with May Day and is in fact often called Mayflower, indicating when it flowers. May Day, or Beltane as it's sometimes known, is an old Celtic fire festival associated with the pagan wheel of the year. But Hawthorne is used in rituals that involve fire at other times of year too. In Herefordshire on New Year's Day, farmers take branches of Hawthorne made into a globe and they burn them. This globe has previously been hung in the kitchen to bring good luck throughout the year and burning it in amongst their wheat fields protects the crops for the coming year. The ivy is one of the last flowers of the season, flowering in September, and it is vital for autumnal pollinators. Moths, butterflies, bees, hoverflies and more all love this late blooming plant. In the Christian religion, the ivy is symbolic of everlasting life as it's an evergreen plant. It is also associated with the Greco-Roman god Bacchus as it's thought to prevent drunkenness. This was not through drinking the ivy itself, though. That would definitely put a stop to your drinking in a very finite way, as it's highly toxic. But instead, this was done by drinking wine from a cup made of ivy. There are some records of ivy berries being added to the wine too, but I'd be curious to know how many actually survived that. For the Victorians, the ivy was associated with the oak and was considered its female counterpart, whilst the oak is male. In this way, it is said to represent the enduring love of a husband and wife, the wife being the ivy clinging to the strong oak. I'll let you decide who came up with that idea. Ivy was also used to divine deaths in your household too. Leave some ivy leaves in a bowl of water overnight on Twelfth Night or Halloween, and if there are black marks on them in the morning, then that's bad news for someone in your household. Why you'd want to divine that, I'm not quite sure. But uncertainty is a powerful thing, so perhaps if someone was ill in your household, you might want to know whether they were going to survive or not. Still, it feels like you're tempting fate here. And these days, all it takes is some practical joker with a sharpie, and you'll be living with a year of wondering who it's going to be. In the Blackthorn resides the moon fairies, Olunantashi. They inhabit the Blackthorn bush and should not be disturbed. They're cruel and vengeful fairies, so if you wish to pick sloes in the autumn without fear of retribution, then do it by the light of a full moon when they are all out dancing elsewhere. If you are a creative sort, an artist, a writer, maybe even a storyteller, then these vampire-like folk will provide you with inspiration and success in return for your life, which will be greatly shortened. So you'll definitely be taking your chances there. A bramble arch is considered a magical thing. This is a branch of bramble that is rooted at both ends. In folk medicine, it was considered that by passing a child beneath this arch a varying number of times, well, you could potentially cure whooping cough. In some circumstances, this meant chanting the following as you did this. 
Over the briar, under the briar, I wish to leave the chincoff here. One of the most famous pieces of Blackberry or Bramble folklore is that on the 29th of September, also known as Michaelmas Day, the devil, or an island the puka, which is like a mischievous spirit, spits or even urinates on the berries. Therefore, you should not eat them after this day. To be fair, they are usually very bitter by late September, October, due to the mildew caused by the fog or the feasting flies, so you probably wouldn't want to eat them anyway. If you find a bramble branch attached to your best milking cow, then you can be sure that someone is trying to cast a spell to curdle the milk, and you will need to seek advice from the local hedge witch. There are many, many more plants you may find in the hedgerows, and as you may expect, volumes and volumes of folklore on these plants. But the ones that I have mentioned are ones that you will regularly find. Next, I'd like to look at some of the animals you might find at this time of year in the habitat. As I mentioned earlier, at this time of year, the ivy flowers hold a feast for butterflies and moths. Butterflies hold mixed omens, as many of the things in the hedgerow do. In Devon, it was thought that if you killed the first butterfly you saw in the season, then you would be struck down with ill health. In Lincolnshire, if you stood on a butterfly, it meant that you defeated your enemies for that year. Just a little public service announcement, though. If you're thinking of trying it and seeing whether it's good or bad luck, please don't stand on butterflies. We desperately need these pollinators, and I'm pretty sure bad luck will fall on us all without them. The colour of the butterfly also brought a message. If the first one of the season that you saw was white, then you would have plenty of money for good food enabling you to eat, and this is a reference to white bread, which would have been mainly for the upper classes. If it was brown, the opposite was true, because you'd be eating brown bread. Butterflies are also considered messengers, ghosts and, in some cases, unbaptised souls. The red admiral butterfly is one you will frequently see at this time of year on ivy blossoms in the hedgerow, and its name is thought to perhaps refer to the two white marks at the top of each forewing, a little like the epaulettes on an admiral. However, it is also thought that they were originally called red admirables, and that this later became Admiral, after the Admiral of the Red Squadron, a ranking which existed within the Navy until the 1800s. Field mice and voles can often be found beneath the hedgerows, and as I mentioned on my hedgerow tour, I often hear them, but rarely spot them. If I do, it's a tail or hind legs as they disappear into the tightly bound roots of the bank. Mice are well embedded in our culture and everyday language with phrases such as quiet as a mouse, playing cat and mouse, mousy hair, or even the slightly more arcane, as poor as a church mouse. In folk medicine, mice were made into a beverage described as a delightsome drink by Edward Topsell in 1607 in his book, The Histories of Four-Footed Beasts. This drink was then used to treat bedwetting, sore throats, whooping cough and fevers. I think I'll stick to Lemsip. Obviously, other cold medicines are available, but I really wouldn't advise mouse smoothie. In the past, it was thought that the soul of a dying person passed out of the body in the form of an animal. This was often thought to be a mouse. The colour of this mouse indicated what kind of a life you had led. Red was actually for a pure soul, and black was for a sinner. If a large number of mice enter your house when you previously had no mice, this is a very bad omen and you should speak to them politely, explaining why their presence is not convenient right now and ask them to leave. Perhaps even suggesting an alternative abode for them. In some cases, this was your neighbours, if you didn't get on too well, that was. And also, bear in mind, your neighbour's going to do the same thing, so you may just end up with a group of mice going to and from your house. There are still plenty of birds that are resident in the UK here, and many of them hang out in hedges. A blackbird's feather placed under someone's pillow means that they will tell you their darkest secrets, and two blackbirds seen together are considered to be good luck. If a blackbird makes a nest in your home, well, this is a very good sign, and if you see two blackbirds together, you'll receive good luck. As I have mentioned in previous episodes of the podcast, the robin is a harbinger of death and bad luck if it happens to hop into your home or tap on the window. And it's been noted, as recently as the 1990s, 
that it was some people's belief that sending a person a Christmas card with a robin on the front of it was a death sign. So all those times you thought you were sending a cheery Christmas card to your loved ones, well, you were actually sending them the equivalent of the pirate's black spot. Nice. If you make a wish on the first robin you see in the winter, then your wish will come true. Just make sure you've managed to speak your wish before the robin flies away. And if you steal its eggs or injure it, then this is very bad luck and you may be afflicted by all manner of illnesses or conditions. The wren is one of the smallest birds in the UK and is known for its little round golf ball body and tiny tail that sits at 90 degrees to its body. One of the most famous traditions associated with the wren is Renning Day, or the wren hunt, which takes place on the 26th of December, also known as St Stephen's Day. This tradition involves taking not just bows and arrows, but guns and large cannons to kill a wren. I say kill, but in modern day wren hunts, the wren is substituted for a model, thank goodness. It is thought that as the wren is a symbol of the king of the birds, or in some cases queen, that they must be killed in order to provide a suitable sacrifice to bless the land for the coming year. These days, the festival is still celebrated in the village of Middleton in Suffolk, and they celebrate with Morris dancing, Victorian dress, and a procession that holds aloft a garland and an effigy of the wren. In Wales, this tradition was continued up until the 19th century and took place on Twelfth Night. Once the wren was caught and killed, it was then placed in a wren house. This was a ribbon-bedecked box, and four men would carry it aloft around the town and sing at each house where they would be greeted with money or drink, a little like the other door-knocking traditions I discussed in the last episode of Season 2. Much like injuring a robin, Killing a wren at any other time of year is extremely bad luck, as indeed it is also the sparrow, as they are both thought to carry the souls of the dead. So these are a few of the autumnal and winter inhabitants of our UK hedgerows, but there are many more. The flora and fauna of our hedgerows that we see every day is very firmly rooted in the earth of this world, but there are also folk within the hedgerow that are not of this world. Folk of the other world. As we have seen with the blackthorn in particular, hedgerows are often synonymous with the other crowd or we folk in the fae. They mark a boundary, an edge, a liminal space, and the thicker and wider the plants and roots of the hedgerow, then the less likely we are to know what's going on within it. There are a variety of fae folk, fairies, pixies, elves, nixies, boggles, boggarts, hobs, redcaps, tiddymen, Brownies, well, the list goes on, and whilst I have touched on some of these beings in different episodes, they really warrant an episode all of their own, which perhaps I will do at some point. There are fairies found in the domestic setting, and fairies found in nature, and the ones found in nature are the ones you might find under a hedge. They're thought to be descendants of pre-Christian gods and goddesses. There is certainly this blurring of the lines between the gods, goddesses and fairies in the ancient tales of the Mabinogion. The fairies of nature are more elemental beings rising from lakes, trees or under the earth to entice mortals to join them in their palaces and other worlds. Fairies as elemental beings of earth, water, fire and air were common beliefs in the medieval period. They are also considered to be protectors of the land, and you will incur their wrath should you lose your respect for the nature that surrounds you. On farmland, though, land worked by humans, well, they appear as helpful beings and less concerned with dancing and feasting and more concerned with getting a job done for you. But still, all is not often as it seems. These fairies seem to create a bridge between the nature fairies and the fairies you might find in your home. There is a school of thought that the idea of hidden folk in the form of ethereal beings comes from when the Celtic invaders arrived in Britain and forced Bronze Age man into hiding. As a result, Bronze Age man became a race that lived in caves and underground places and were rarely seen. So it is possible that over time they became otherworldly in the minds of the Celts and to future generations. The idea that iron can be used against them may also come because the Celts bought iron weapons and these could not so easily be defeated by Neolithic and Bronze Age tools. One thing all these spirits have in common, though, is that they are troublesome things, as Diane Perkis refers to in her book of the same title. 
there are many fairy tales and stories of folk being spirited away by the other crowd. Changelings, young and old, musicians and lone travellers. In many cases, the only things that have prevented these people coming to harm is to have an item of iron in their pocket, perform a ritual of some description, or have faith in a religion. In some rural areas, by respecting these often unseen beings, wildlife and the landscape are also being protected. Perhaps this is the root reason for these beliefs. They help maintain a balance. There are many rules when it comes to meeting the fairies and wee folk. Don't eat their food, don't drink their drink, do not refuse to dance, and never say thank you or sorry. Many still believe these folk are among us, and Eddie Lenahan talks of these meetings in his book, The Other Crowd. It's an excellent read and packed full of anecdotes and folklore. All this brings us to the story for this episode, the tale of Yallery Brown. This is the story of a man wandering home after a night in the pub when he stumbles upon a boggart, although it's never explicitly said that Yallery Brown is a boggart. However, I label him this way as he has all the hallmarks of a mischievous farmland spirit. This story is a Lincolnshire legend and was collected by one of my favourite fairy tale collectors, Joseph Jacobs. However, it was first published in written form in 1891 by the folklorist and story collector M.C. Balfour. It's gone on to appear in many collections of tales, and so this is my version of Yallery Brown. Many moons ago, there was a man named Tom, as they often are in these tales. Well, they're either called Tom or, or Jack or John. But the young man in this tale is Tom. He was known for being a little work shy, but had a good sense of humour and always saw the positives in life. So his work colleagues tolerated him leaving the heavy work for them. They tolerated him not wanting to milk the cow or pick the hooves of the horse that was liable to kick you, and they tolerated him leaving an hour or so early to visit the local pub. It was after one of these occasions that Tom had been in a hostelry, supping a pint or two, and he was working his way across the fields. The moon was full and the hedges were high, and they sheltered him from the cold north wind. Tom rolled as he walked on account of the stout, and when he heard a small voice carried on the wind, which sounded like it said something like, Help me, help me! He thought, well, it must be the drink playing with his mind, and he shrugged it off. But the voice got louder as he worked his way along the path, until eventually it was so loud he couldn't ignore it. It was shrill, almost a shriek, and he had to stop and look around to see where it might be coming from. He called out again. I'm under the stone, down here, look down here! Tom indeed did look down. And there was a large stone that was well embedded in the grass and the nettles and the dying dock flowers that were under the hedgerow. Moss and lichen grew freely upon it and gave it the mottled look that only years of weathering bring. He bent down to see if he could lift it. It was a heavy thing and he struggled to get his fingers underneath it in order to prise it from its resting place. It took a good few minutes of wiggling the stone back and forth, scraping at the earth and the grass until it was free. And when it finally did come free... Tom almost fell over backwards. Peering into the hole that was left behind, Tom saw what could only be described as a wizened baby. It was curled up in the fetal position, squinting at the light from the moon. The being had a long beard and small brown eyes. His hair was white as the blackthorn flowers and its skin weathered and aged. Tom stumbled backwards, trying to make sense of it all. Was it a boggle, a boggart, a hob, a red cap? What on earth was it? No, it didn't have a hat. It couldn't be a red cap. A fairy of some sort, though. A tiddyman, perhaps, or maybe a leprechaun. He had heard of those from his Irish cousins. Do not try to work out what I am, for it is not worth your time. I thank you greatly for freeing me, though, the being shouted up, and then unfurling itself. It began to dance around Tom, who stood there bemused and unsure whether or not what he saw before him was actually really happening, 
or whether it was just still the effects of the drink. I must ask you what your name is, good sir, said Tom, remembering that it was always best to show the little creatures some respect, for this was one thing that he knew was a universal rule for all of the other crowd. Yallery Brown is my name, and I will do you a favour in return for the one you have done me. Ask me anything you like, I will make sure it happens. A wife, good fortune, a curse upon your enemies, long life. It's yours for the taking, Tom. Well now, Tom had to think about this. He didn't really want a wife. And really, what was the use of money? He had more than enough for the life he wanted to lead. And a curse upon enemies? Well, he knew that curses only ever came back to haunt you. Long life? Again, Tom really wasn't quite sure what to do with that. There was one thing he would like, though, and that was to do less work. It's done, said Yallery Brown, without Tom having to utter a word. So, ah, uh ah, -uh, said the little man, waving his shriveled finger at Tom. You must never say that word, for if you do, everything that I have given you will be undone. Should you ever need me again, well, you can call on me by saying, Yallery Brown, come out from your earthbound home. And with that, the little man disappeared back underneath the hedgerow. And for quite a while, Tom could hear the little man singing as he disappeared across the fields. Tom continued on his way home. And as soon as his head hit the pillow of his bed, he fell into an ale-induced sleep. The next morning, Tom rose early and went to work as usual. Slightly fuggy-headed, but capable of performing the tasks that had, for him, over the years, become muscle memory. When he arrived at the farm, there was a commotion as the other workers observed that Tom's tasks had already been completed. Tom found the hay he was meant to move to the stable was already there. He found the horses brushed and cleaned, their tack polished. He found the cows milked and the pigs fed. There was absolutely nothing he needed to do. Things did not go so well for his co-workers, though. They found that their tasks were made harder. The buckets of milk, which they'd carefully filled from the cows, were now upset. Whenever they went into the barns, the hay was never stacked as tidy as Tom's was. And, well, whenever they tried to pick the horse's hooves, they'd find themselves on the receiving end of a kick. It didn't matter which horse they went to. It was as if something was irritating that horse. When they tried to stick to tasks that avoided the rear end of the horse, like cleaning out the stables once they were out in the fields, well, they found that the minute that they went back in after getting rid of the dung on the dung heap, well, it was as dirty as when they'd started. Other farmhands felt sure that there was some mischief afoot and that Tom was at the root of it. They decided that his practical jokes and workplace humour had gone too far this time. And they started to grumble and talk among themselves. Some even believed it was magic. Tom tried to make amends. He arrived at work earlier than he thought Yallery Brown could manage, so they could try and do some of the work before Yallery got there. But Yallery Brown was not having that. The little man was never seen, but he was always there. Even if Tom tried to do the work of his co-workers, he still found himself with pain in his lower back, which was akin to getting a good kick up the backside. So... Tom just stopped trying. After all, what was the point when all his tasks were already completed? And, well, he was being paid by the farmer still. After a month or so of these shenanigans, it was all too much for the other workers on the farm. There was unrest. They threatened to down tools and strike. They were going to leave if something was not done about Tom and the mischief making. It didn't really matter to the farmer that Tom was doing his work. What mattered was that all the while that Tom was there... There was twice as much work for other farmhands and, most importantly, unrest on his farm. So he sacked Tom. Of course, this didn't please Tom because now he wasn't being paid and he had to go and find another job. And he knew, he knew in the back of his mind that wherever he went, Yallery Brown would find him and insist on completing his jobs to the point where it alienated him from his colleagues once more. So he went into the field, to that same spot by the hedge, with that same stone. In fact, the soil was still attached to the bottom of it, reminding him of what had happened that night, and he called out for Yallery Brown. The little sprite appeared before him, grinning and hopping from foot to foot. 
Hello, Tom. Are you enjoying the work I have done for you? Where are we going next? We're going nowhere, and I'll thank you to stay out of my business from now on, Yallery Brown. Oh, you've done it now, Tom. I told you, I told you not to thank me. You will rue the day you lifted that stone, Tom. And with that, the little man started to dance around Tom once more, singing. Work as thou will, thou'lt never do well. Work as thou mayst, thou'lt never gain grist. From harm and mischance and yallery brown, thou'lt let out thyself from under the stone. As he danced, the air was blue with the words of the little man who cursed and mocked and needled Tom. And when Yallery had finally disappeared across the fields, the words of his song rang in Tom's ears. For harm and mischance and Yallery Brown, thou let out thyself from under the stone. Tom travelled to many places, trying to find work. But as Yallery had promised, nothing Tom did came to any good. No farm he ever worked on kept him for more than a few days. For even though Tom stopped visiting the local pubs, he still found that he would sleep in inexplicably late. Or worse, still be found sleeping in a hayrick in the middle of the day. He thought maybe he would try the job of a fisherman, but his net was always empty and his crewmates soon saw him as a bad luck charm. So he tried a more solitary role, the role of a miller. But his flour was always full of weevils and mice and rats overran his windmill. And so it was that Tom ended up with only an antisocial stray cat for company. No flower. So what became of Tom in the end? I'm afraid I don't know. For when Tom stopped trying, well, the story stopped too. But if you ever meet Tom, sit with him a while. Offer him bread and cheese. And you never know. He might tell you the story of Yallery Brown himself. Thank you for patrons for their continued support of traditional storytelling and the podcast. My patron is called Rewild Yourself Through Story and is focused on using story to reconnect with the land we live on and the nature within it. You can become a patron to benefit from a range of rewards, such as digital zines, a book club, audio stories, previews, extended versions of previous seasons of this podcast, and online workshops. There are, of course, other ways to support this podcast, and you can do this by sharing the podcast with your friends and, if you have the time, leaving me a review as this all helps these stories to travel to new audiences and find new souls to warm. If you wish to hear more stories woven with folklore in the old ways, well, you can find me on Instagram as Dee underscore Storyteller, on Facebook as Dee Storyteller and on Twitter as Dee underscore Storyteller. I do hope to see you there as I would love to tell you another story. Until then, I'll see you next time. Toodle pip!